you are going to okay. be doing your introduction in this. But what I'm going to say uh, to our it's audience tricky. first, it, it's not, is it tricky? I think you know where you've been and you know what you've been up done to. It and before, you know what people, so, uh, you yeah, have done it before. I, I, I am completely too. confident that you've got this thing nailed. But what I'm going to do is right before I take myself down off and leave yeah. you on the stage, I'm basically going to sit here and look at this big, beautiful audience. And I'm going to say, all right, everybody, I want you to help me welcoming to the stage Donald Robertson. Applause is entirely appropriate. And it sounds like this. All right, friend, it's all well, you. Thank you. That was a sterling introduction. Thank you very much, Phil. You're always good at organizing and hosting these things. I'm kind of tempted to show you what I'm drinking here. I don't know if oh, you, you can't see that because the blurring. I've got Mastika water, which I promise you is non-alcoholic. I don't think you can get this in America. It's like a Greek thing. So I'm in Athens at the moment. That's why I'm drinking Mystica water. And uh, I was here to speak at a conference. I'm going to be here for a couple of months. I'm Scottish. I was a cognitive behavioral therapist for many years. I, tried, I ran a training school. I was a clinical supervisor. And uh, my first degree is in philosophy. And I wound up writing. My specialism became the relationship between philosophy and psychotherapy. That's what my master's degree is in. And, uh, you know, at the time I got into those things that seemed like a really nerdy kind of niche subject. People would make fun of me for studying, like it was the most useless thing in the world. And then somehow it kind of became popular. And Ryan Holiday and uh, Bill Irvine and Massimo Pellucci and, and people like that started writing books about stoicism that were kind of self-help books. And stoicism really took off. And that surprised everybody, I think. And so now I write books about Stoicism. I've written three books in a row about Marcus Aurelius. And I've just written a book about Socrates. Uh, unusually, I've got two books coming out this year. I had one that was a biography of Marcus Aurelius. And I've got one in November uh, about Socrates coming out. That's, I guess, a prequel to How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. It's like How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Um, but if it was How to Think Like a balding, pot-bellied, middle-aged Athenian man. Lay, or That was too long, though, so we just called it how to think like Socrates. So, yeah, I write books about philosophy, history, psychotherapy, and self-improvement. And my, my publisher once told me I had to pick a genre because he said when we send your books to the bookshops, they can't put them in all of those different shelves. And so I find when I go to the bookshops, I, it, it, it's kind of funny in a way, because they, I find that some of my books, it's a surprise where they've actually shelved them. You know, how to think of Roman Empire, sometimes in the history section, sometimes it's in the philosophy section, sometimes it's in the, the self-help section. It kind of varies from one shop to another, I think. So, yeah, that's what I do. I'm the president and founder also of Plato's Academy Centre, which is kind of partly why I'm in Athens at the moment. We are fundraising uh, to build a conference centre near the original location of Plato's Academy, not on top of it. The government are doing that. Like we just, we just want to build a place near it. And uh, at the moment, what we're planning to do is open a coffee shop, stroke bookshop, where people can go and have a coffee and do Socratic uh, dialogues. We hope facilitated workshops in a couple of minutes from the original location of Plato's Academy. You may have seen in the news recently, like because people have sent me this about ten times now that they, somebody claimed, some uh, researchers in Italy, that they'd found Plato's grave, but I don't think they have. Like, they haven't actually, so get super excited about that. But he is buried somewhere, in uh, probably, I think, under somebody's house in Academia Platinos, unfortunately. We're going to have to throw someone out the house if we want to dig up Plato, sadly. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm here doing. I'm also one of the founders of the Modern Stoicism nonprofit. And I was one of the original authors of Stoic Week, and uh, I've organized the Stoicon annual conference in the past. And basically, that's everything that's worth knowing about me, I think. Okay, let's go. So, Marcus Aurelius's birthday, we are celebrating live from Athens um, by talking about how Stoicism can save Western democracy. So this is going to be interesting. I've got a lot to say about this. It's a little bit kind of um, of a touchy subject, an emotional subject. Um, so I think uh, it's an important subject, though. I want to start off by saying it must seem ironic 
to claim that a Roman emperor, of all people, could save our democracy? Does it even need saving, some people might ask. I think democracy is always under threat, but right now it faces new threats in the form of modern technology, such as social media and artificial intelligence. We've created this. The wealthy and powerful now have four, far more far more sophisticated tools at their disposal for deceiving and manipulating the people than at any point in history, if they choose to do so. And as we shall see, political oratory and persuasion has typically been at loggerheads with philosophy since the birth of democracy in ancient Athens over two and a half thousand years ago. I'm at the um, Athens the beacon of philosophy, also the birthplace of democracy. So allow me to digress a little bit and say something about the historical cultural context, the relationship between these things. Athenian democracy under Pericles arguably worked pretty well at the beginning. It quickly became obvious, though, that the system, the democratic system that was created, contained certain flaws. These were inevitably exploited to the maximum before a law. The first generation of democratic leaders were at least somewhat more concerned with what was in the best interests of their city-state as a whole, of Athens. Debates in the assembly were more civil, more concerned with drawing reasonable conclusions from verifiable facts, and political leaders such as Pericles consulted with experts in specific fields where appropriate, something that Socrates is very much in favour of and which people seem kind of against doing today. I think we all know that's how, broadly speaking, democracy is supposed to function. Toward the end of his life, though, Pericles witnessed the rise of a new generation of politicians, uh -oh, known as the demagogues. The most prominent among them was a, a man named Cleon. Now, demagogue from the Greek uh, demos, or people, and agogos, or leader, um, could be taken to mean a leader of the people, and that might sound like a good thing, but it's always, in fact, carried a negative connotation. It actually means something more like what we describe as a rabble rouser, of course. When the ancient Greeks speak of demagogues, they don't mean men who lead the people, but rather those who manipulate and exploit them, typically by using emotive rhetoric that fuels greed or whips up fear and anger. A demagogue, we might say, is not someone who leads, but someone who misleads the people. Cleon pandered to public opinion by attacking the ruling elite for corruption, although he was accused of corruption himself. He constantly denounced the character of Pericles and other aristocrats using coarse language, yelling and striding around, slapping his thigh, apparently, and generally posturing before the assembly, before the electorate, basically, like an actor in a satirical play or something like that. Uh, playing to the gallery, playing to the audience. Perhaps he even did so with some justification. It may be that he was right to say that some man or other took bribes and another perhaps was a coward. You might say, yeah, but he, he had a point, right? It was at this point, I think, however, that the gradual decline of Athenian democracy and its eventual collapse into dictatorship became inevitable. Um, dictatorship, I mean, under the 30 tyrants, which happened during the lifetime of Socrates. Yeah, but he had a point, you might say again. Something can be both true and misleading, though. As William Blake, the poet, said, a truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can invent. If Pericles says that the Athenians should avoid fighting the Spartans and their allies in an infantry battle, which he was famous for doing, and Cleon responds by accusing Pericles of misappropriating public funds, that bit might be true, but it's misleading nonetheless because it does nothing to prove that the proposal under discussion is wrong. It's a diversionary tactic. It's rhetoric. You cannot prove someone wrong by attacking their character, generally speaking, even if your criticisms are based on the truth. The truth can, in many ways, be used to divert attention and mislead people into drawing false and sometimes dangerous conclusions. Um, Cleon, in fact, nearly got Socrates killed because of his uh, hawkish military strategy. 
1986, the philosopher Harry Frankfurt wrote an essay titled, and pardon my French here, well, on bullshit, which became a surprise bestseller when published as a book much later in 2005. Frankfurt argued that lying and bullshit are two different things. And people are often confused about this distinction. And, and in fact, it's, a, a, it's kind of a big problem that people are unclear about the difference between these two things. Since the early days of human civilization, we've punished people for lying. In some instances, it might even be against the law to tell a lie. In court, we're sworn to tell the truth. Humans are cunning, however, they're sneaky characters, human beings. And we naturally evolved many ways in which we could manipulate and deceive other people or bullshit them without even having to tell a lie. Cleon and his fellow demagogues were among the first great pioneers of bullshit, you could say. They were, in a sense, talented amateurs. Already, though, professional bullshitters were plying their trade in Athens. These men were experts on the art of rhetoric and political oratory, who trained others how to persuade the assembly, the law courts, and other institutions of anything they wished, regardless of its truth or falsehood. They charged exorbitant fees and became fabulously wealthy as a result. I am speaking, of course, of our friends, the sophists. Now, from the rule of Nero onward, there was a resurgence of interest in Greek culture, known uh, as the second sophistic in, in the Roman Empire. And it was spearheaded by Greek-speaking intellectuals and orators known as sophists. The leading figure in this movement during the life of Marcus Aurelius, happy birthday, Marcus, was Herodes Atticus, of whom it was said that all of his contemporary sophists were mere slices, as they only had a fraction of his talent for eloquence and persuasion. Herodes Atticus was raised for a time in the household of Marcus Aurelius's maternal great-grandfather, presumably alongside Marcus's mother, who was herself a highly educated woman, completely fluent in Greek. Shortly after Marcus reached the age for his tertiary education, around 15 in Roman society, Herodes was appointed his senior Greek rhetoric tutor, of whom Marcus actually had three, three re Greek rhetoric tutors, that is. Herodes was an immensely, fabulously wealthy, but controversial figure. He was well-versed in the discourses of Epictetus, but considered Stoicism to go too far in rooting out the most virile emotions, as he put it. However, he had a violent temper and stood trial, but was acquitted, of kicking his pregnant wife to death. He was kind of a nasty piece of work, right? During a later trial, he lunged at Marcus as though about to strangle him. He's about to strangle the emperor, but was stopped in his tracks and narrowly avoided getting his head chopped off by the Praetorian prefect. Marcus, we're told, calmly rose and adjourned the hearing, completely unfazed by the attack and said he'd continue again, he'd resume the trial the next day. Herodes Atticus has really, like many, you know, rich, controversial figures, left his figure, left his stamp on Athens. And the most obvious example would be the big theatre on the side of the Acropolis is called the Odeon of Herodes Atticus. It's used by the Greeks for many concerts today. And Brian Eno and the Foo Fighters, you can go on YouTube and see a concert by the Foo Fighters playing in the Odeon of Herodes Atticus. How's that for a, a strange connection? Marcus loved the study of rhetoric, however. Uh, he loved oratory as a young man, but he became more devoted to Stoic philosophy uh, around his mid-twenties. He'd been into philosophy since he was 12 years old, we're told, but he didn't really commit f like fully to Stoicism until his mid-twenties, we believe. This seems to have been almost like a religious conversion for him, a decision that filled him with anguish and inner turmoil. He talks about losing his appetite and things, like he was really angst-ridden about this. None of Marcus's Greek rhetoric tutors, or sophists, are praised in book one of the meditations, interestingly, when he lists the virtues of everyone he admires. There's like 17 people. He doesn't mention any of these three uh, teachers. Herodes Atticus is the most famous educator, intellectual of the empire. He's a family friend, 
Marcus passes him over completely in silence. And incidentally, Marcus praises an anonymous slave that was like a nanny tutor to him. Herodes Atticus would have been absolutely, um, you know, mortified if he'd, he'd read that. You know, I didn't really take anything of value from the, the most famous intellectual of the period, but, you know, the slave in my grandfather's household that looked after me when I was a little kid, he was a great man in my eyes. Wow, that would have blown Herodes Atticus's mind to have seen that. Um, anyway, the, the tutor that Marcus heaps most praise on is Junius Rusticus, the one who persuaded him to embrace Stoicism rather than sophistry. Marcus says Rusticus showed him that his character required moral correction and therapy. And from him, he says, I learned not to be led astray into the emulation of sophists. Rusticus freed Marcus as a young man from the grip of the sophists. There's a bit of drama going on here, right? In another passage, concluding his summary of the lessons for which he was grateful, Marcus says he's thankful that when he had an inclination to philosophy, he, in his own words, did not fall into the hands of any sophist. Presumably, he must have had Herodes Atticus in mind, primarily here, of whom all the other sophists were mere slices, his family friend that he doesn't mention. All he says is, I'm glad I didn't fall into the hands of any sophists. Marcus elsewhere praises his adoptive father, the emperor Antoninus Pius, by saying, no one could ever say of him that he was either a sophist or servile or a pedant. Presumably, unlike the Emperor Hadrian, his predecessor and Marcus's adoptive grandfather, who was notoriously pedantic and surrounded himself with sophists and did try to emulate them. In another passage, Marcus likewise says that Antoninus was not given to reproaching people, nor timid, nor suspicious, nor a sophist. So it's clear, therefore, that Marcus admired his adoptive father as a role model and saw him as a proper statesman, not a demagogue, who pandered to the Senate or the people and manipulated them using the rhetorical tricks of the sophists. Marcus was himself grateful to have been awoken early on, while he was still Caesar, from the spell cast by the sophists, like Herodes Atticus, after his stoic tutor, Junius Rusticus persuaded him that he needed moral education and stoic psychotherapy. So there's a real drama here. Marcus sees himself as going through a kind of a, almost a religious conversion. He's saved and requires therapy and moral correction to be snapped out of this trance that's caused by rhetoric. And the people who really see rhetoric as kind of the most important thing in life, in a sense, is more important than truth or justice, for example. Marcus continued to love rhetoric, however, and went out of his way to hear acclaimed orators in person throughout the rest of his life. However, he no longer bought into the sophist assumption that the power of persuasion is kind of an end in itself, something that can be all-powerful, with or without, the moral wisdom that comes from studying philosophy. To borrow a famous analogy from Socrates, someone, such as a politician, who is skilled in rhetoric but lacks wisdom, is no better than a man who wields a sharp sword but is wearing a blindfold. We can, might say someone waving a gun around, like it makes them powerful, but it would be like if they're wearing a, a blindfold. Well, they've gone insane or something like that. Rhetorical influence is simply dangerous in the hands of somebody that lacks moral wisdom. In another famous analogy, Socrates, in Plato's Gorgias, says that a genuine statesman who cares about what is best for his city resembles a physician who has studied medicine and nutrition carefully and is able to prescribe a diet that's good for the city's health. Sometimes he may have to prescribe bitter medicine or bland, bland food, but if we trust his expertise, uh, we'll follow his advice and we'll get well. A demagogue, by contrast, who implies, employs sophistry, behaves more like a confectioner, says Plato, who makes sweets for a living. He doesn't care whether they're good or bad for our health. And so he hasn't even bothered to study medicine or nutrition. He's guided solely by feedback or rather praise. If we say his sweets are delicious, he feeds us more of the same. He is, in other words, a bullshit merchant who feeds us whatever junk food we're willing to consume, even if it rots our guts and makes all our teeth fall out. Socrates says that if the physician were to try to criticize the confectioner before an audience of children, 
who also lacked any education in medicine or nutrition, there would be a riot. He's talking, of course, about politics, and we are the children in this metaphor. So long as we remain ignorant of philosophy, the principles of justice, and the interests of our society, we'll probably swallow any bullshit that the sophists want to sell us, because they are experts at making the ignorant fall under their spell. Today, the ancient sophists are long dead and buried. Herodes Atticus has been pushing up daisies for like, you know, nearly 2,000 years. However, politicians still exist, and they have advisors who behave much like the ancient sophists. Now, side note, I reviewed Roger Stone's, and he could have been a right-wing or a left-wing figure, it doesn't matter, but Roger Stone is probably the best example, I think, of someone in this category. Um, his book, Stone's Rules, and there's a documentary about it you can watch on Netflix, really to an extraordinary degree mirrors the kind of cynicism of some of the, the sophists um, or who are themselves kind of political advisors in, in classical Athens. We can also see marketing, social media, and the news media as the modern day successors of this tra long tradition of political rhetoric. In the ancient world, you had to leave your house to go to the Agora or to the Paniques or to the public gymnasia and stand around for hours to listen to political orators and sophists speak bullshit. Now they follow you home. You could be sitting on the toilet, on your mobile phone, watching their videos on YouTube, being brainwashed by influencers, as they're called today, while you do your business. We've allowed political rhetoric and other forms of influence to take over our lives. Thanks to modern technology, its influence is far more pervasive than Socrates or Marcus Aurelius could ever have possibly imagined in their wildest dreams or nightmares. Marcus had therapy to get himself over this. He says it was stoicism that awoke him from the spell or nightmare of the sophists. So what can we learn from him in this regard? How, as emperor, did he follow the example set by Antoninus Pius and avoid being duped by political rhetoric? If we can learn that, perhaps we can salvage modern democracy in the age of the internet and prevent it from degenerating into mere demagoguery. Marcus realized that this is both a philosophical and therapeutic question. We have to learn how to think rationally and exhibit wisdom, but that means not being swept along by strong desires like greed or allowing emotions like intense fear and anger to lead us astray. I can only offer some tentative suggestions about how Stoicism might be able to help us in this regard, based, for instance, on some of the examples we find in the meditations. In psychotherapy, we teach clients to look for what we call early warning signs, because catching a problem early often makes it much easier to prevent it from escalating and overwhelming us. I believe that's true of political rhetoric. For example, the beginnings of intense negative emotions, such as fear and anger, are often early warning signs of psychological problems. If you're starting to feel outraged about something online or worried, it might be that you're being manipulated by politicians who benefit from you being made to feel angry or afraid. Noticing the very first stirrings of these emotions can help us to gain objecti objectivity <clears throat> because there's a point beyond which fear and anger, as we all know, can make us lose all perspective. We've all seen people consumed by a rational fear or anger because they've been whipped up into a state of uh, <coughs> confusion, hysteria, by conspiracy theories or political extremists. And we know how irrational their behavior can seem from the outside. We're all vulnerable to that, though. In truth, changes in your voice or facial expression are, in my clinical experience, often the most helpful early warning signs to derail extreme bouts of anger or anxiety. And seeing through this can help us regain our composure and think about what's happening more rationally. I mean, the, the biggest insights you'll ever get in therapy are things that are glaringly obvious from another point of view. So, you know, 
people say, well, by the time I've realized that I'm worrying, it's kind of spiraled out of control. If I could only spot it earlier, then maybe, you know, I'd, I'd still be able to gain some objectivity. You know, how do you know when you're beginning to worry? Other people can see it right away because your voice sounds different. They can hear it. The look in your eyes is different. You probably frown. You maybe tense your shoulders, right? It's typically things that people are unaware that they're doing but are really obvious to everyone else. Or if you're starting to become angry, other people can probably hear it in your voice and see it in your facial expression. But those are things you're kind of oblivious to, but you can train yourself to notice them. And that gives you... Um, uh, an opportunity to nip uh, the the cycle in the bud earlier, like well, it's still easier to control. This is the sort of advice we find in Epictetus, and to some extent in the meditations of, of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus says we should respond in various ways, for example, to the initial warning signs of anger. He lists 10 strategies at one point, and that list is not even exhaustive of the techniques used in Stoicism. The most important strategy he names, arguably, is the famous one found in Epictetus, which Marcus quotes several times. We should remind ourselves, he says, that it's not things or people that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. It's not, it's not politicians that upset you, right? Like, it's not vegans, it's not drag queens, you know, it's not Tucker Carlson, it's not Donald Trump, it's not Joe Biden, it's not Margaret Thatcher, it's not English people, it's not Scottish people that upset you, it's your opinions about them. We call this cognitive distancing in modern psychology. It refers to our ability to step out of our own heads and view our thoughts as if we were observing someone else's. That doesn't mean that they're true or false, but it simply gives us a different perspective on them and we're, we're less absorbed in them, basically. Sophistry uses rhetoric to bring about the opposite effect. It wants us to fuse what is said with reality as if they're one and the same. So when people use rhetoric, they really want you to, it's not even that they, they just want you to believe what they're saying. The whole point of rhetoric is to persuade people of things, but it's actually more than that. It's to achieve something that we call cognitive fusion, whereby you kind of experience what's being said. It's evocative, like it becomes your reality. You know, that's why rhetoric often speeches, political oratory, it's like telling a story. It's, it's, it's not just persuasive, it's also evocative. And that's psychologically very important. Marcus keeps reminding himself, however, to separate his thoughts from external events. Um, you know, he'd be spoiling the story, like ruining it. Like he's not uh, allowing himself to get entranced hypnotized um, by rhetoric. He's paying attention to the way the story is being told rather than becoming lost in the story. That ability to view our own thoughts in a detached way dilutes the emotional impact of rhetoric and it also preserves our cognitive flexibility. When we take a step back, we get less upset, in other words, and we remain more able to view events from more than one perspective. The sophists want to trick us into seeing events from only one perspective, theirs. They do that by various tricks, uh, many, many tricks, such as, I think one of the most common ones is presenting information selectively. This is, uh, correlates to what we call selective thinking and cognitive therapy. For instance, and I'm only picking this guy because it's the most recent example I can think of, Tucker Carlson, and it could be a left-wing media figure, it doesn't matter, like recently made a video telling Americans that groceries in Russia are really cheap. Um, he, I think it's obvious that he wanted viewers to conclude that there was something wrong with the US economy. It may well be that there's something wrong with the US economy. And that maybe uh, the dictator or uh, Vladimir Putin, however you want to call him, is a good leader in some ways, perhaps. But this is still bullshit or sophistry. Because Tucker avoided telling his audience that salaries are also very low in Russia, something you think most people realize, much lower than in America, and that food is also cheap in many other poorer countries, such as Greece, where I'm at the moment, or Mexico, like, and not just in Russia. Like, so it's very selective information, which distorts its significance. The political left and right both use the same tactics to manipulate their audiences. The Stoics, as I mentioned, warn us to look out for unhealthy passions, extreme desires and emotions as warning signs that we're thinking irrationally and not philosophically. 
perhaps because we've been duped by sophists, by selective information, um, by hyperbole, uh, by ad hominem arguments and like other forms of distorted reasoning. Socrates liked to point to another early warning sign, contradiction. To spot our own contradictions, though, we have to be willing to examine our beliefs more closely. Socrates would engage in philosophical dialogues with his friends every day, asking them probing questions to clarify their reasoning and highlight contradictions. Some people hated him for doing that, but others found it liberating and kept coming back for more. If we have the courage to root out and face up to our own moral contradictions, we can take that as evidence that our thinking has gone astray if we find some, and it can help us to protect us against the baneful influence of rhetoric and sophistry, even in the digital age. I think one reason for this is that rhetoric often works by encouraging us to make irrational generalizations, like scapegoating certain groups, stereotyping them. The Socratic method often highlights exceptions to such generalizations. So by its very nature, it encourages us to question overgeneralizations in our thinking. When I was a boy, growing up in the west of Scotland, people used to say things like, all Irish people are terrorists, or all Catholics are terrorists which most modern-day Americans would now consider ridiculous, sweeping generalizations. Obviously, there have been some Irish Catholic terrorists, like the IRA, they existed, but not all Irish people or all Catholics are the same. And there have been Protestant terrorists and agnostic terrorists and so on. It's obviously wrong to lump everyone together because of their religion or nationality. Of course, it's crazy, right? Nevertheless, now some people in the US and elsewhere say exactly the same things, it seems to me, about Muslims. Socrates liked to highlight moral contradictions in another way, which I think is relevant. He asked a young man called Critobulus what qualities he most looked for in a good friend, then asked him how many of those qualities he possessed himself. We call this the double standard strategy in cognitive therapy. It can be viewed as a way of exposing moral contradictions, or you could even say moral hypocrisy. I believe political rhetoric, which aims to manipulate people's perceptions of others, typically leads them into these sorts of moral contradictions. We can protect ourselves against it and perform therapy on ourselves, therefore, by using techniques like the Socratic method to root out our own contradictions, our own hypocrisy, and trying to resolve it rationally and philosophically. As I mentioned earlier, Marcus used many different cognitive strategies to protect himself against irrational passions of the sort exploited by sophists and political orators. He focused particularly on anger, which I think is the emotion we have most trouble with ourselves today. You just need to read the comments under many YouTube videos to see how angry many young people are. It's my belief that's made worse and worse and worse by certain popular self-improvement influencers who combine self-help advice with political rhetoric, a combination that has proven to be very toxic in the past. If an influencer is trying to make you angry about something, you should, I think, recall Marcus Aurelius's advice that anger does us more harm often than the things about which we're angry. It's easy to see that when we look at the anger and outrage exhibited by strangers online, they all seem to be harming themselves by allowing anger to get the best of them. We need to be able to step back and observe our own thoughts, though, as the Stoics advise, in order to avoid falling into the same old trap. Once you are there, uh, in the, the grip of a, a passion, it's difficult to get yourself back out. Angry people are self-righteous. They almost always think they're justified in their outrage, even if it seems crazy to observe us. I think there are several stoic techniques, again, which can help us with this, but one is the view from above, which Marcus loved to practice. If we can imagine looking at our current thoughts and feelings from a broader perspective and observing ourselves as if looking at a stranger, we're more likely to see beyond our passions rather than being trapped inside them. That's how I think... I hope we may be able to break the spell cast by the sophists and save democracy from the demagogues. And with that, Phil, I conclude.